Table Talk is not your typical D&D TTRPG podcast. We are not here to run you through our whole campaign. We're here to talk about everything else in the space of Table Talk. I'm your host, Alejandra Wilhelm. And I'm also your host, Mariah Gresham. And we're your tabletop roleplay girlies. Alrighty, and we are live. Welcome back to another episode of Table Talk with just your roleplay girlies again today, just me and Mariah. This episode, Mariah, you've got a lot of uh, interesting things that you found uh, for I did. us to discuss. I scavenged the internet. Um, <laughs> I was taking a sip of tea at a very poorly ti- poorly timed moment. Yeah, so we were we couldn't decide what we wanted to talk about, and I've kind of had the idea in my head of like, oh, it'd be fun to like scour Reddit a- as we do when you just like want to see what what people are up to and what nonsense is afoot. And so I found myself in the D and D subreddit under the table disputes section. I was like, it would be interesting to read off some of these like more. Either like there's some that are wild, there's some that are like mechanical disputes and things and like have us weigh in and also use it as a little launching platform to any of our listeners. If you have a weird and either weird and wacky story you want us to relate, like talk about, not relate to my brain, you want us to cover or like react to. There we go. That's the R word I was going for. You got there. I can I can English. I write for a living. (laughs) Or you have like a a problem or a situation that you would genuinely like our perspective on as people who have like been playing the game for a while, who have been running games for a while. Uh, we would love for you to like DM that to us on on Instagram or on a social or leave it in a comment. If we like, we'll probably make a post about it at some point where you can just like make like a threads post or something and people can just yep. like dump, let it dump all their stuff. And then we could like do this periodically or like have where we like react to these situations sort of give our give our little input like a talk show a little style situation or like make a little segment or something like that i just thought it would be fun but we're gonna start by just giving our unsolicited opinion that no one asked for (laughs) that nobody asked for (laughs) we have plenty of i mean i suppose they asked for opinions because they put it on reddit by posting it on a public forum yeah they didn't ask for us to cover it on a on a podcast and take it to like another auditory medium but we're gonna do that because it amuses me fair enough and we need a topic for today there you go it works you want to read the the first one i will so this one's interesting to me as like a writer i was like oh this is this is fun so first one is title is player wants bbeg to recite monologue they wrote So the text is, I'm a first-time DM, and I'm currently running a module that has deviated quite far from what the original source was. We love that. We know that well. Um, I have incorporated various PC backstories to entwine with one another and have an overarching BBEG. One of the PCs now wants me to use specific dialogue in the final encounter with the BBEG that would completely dissolve any shared connection with the other PCs in order for it to allow them to tie their character into a book they are writing. I have reservations on how to approach this, as it would ruin a satisfying ending. However, this character has spawned from their backstory. Any suggestions? And the note is they've specifically written word for word how they would like me to say the final words of the BBEG, which basically makes the BBEG sound like a pawn. Yeah, that one is interesting because yes. there's a line as a as a dm or a gm respectively that you're like i am here to facilitate a story for my players Mm -hmm. but then there are times where you like you know it is it is a fight against like the main character syndrome that can develop for sure especially whenever it's like like in this case that bbg stemmed from the backstory of one particular character Mm -hmm. so it can be hard to ensure that the spotlight is not always on them um, yes and i think i can relate to this a little bit because like in our Strixhaven campaign like your death god is one mm-hmm. that you that you're writing a book mm-hmm. around and so and like yes or i've debate i've debated writing i think at some point i would like to write um a call's like story as just like a a new age just it's very tragic and it's not a happy ending at all and i would like to, i would like to at some point write that as a novel yeah. i have a different idea that i'm running with now but 
yeah. So it has been interesting to sort of balance that. And I feel like there's a canon from a call in the game. And then there's a version of him that I would write in a novel and they are not the same. Exactly. Yeah. If that makes because, sense. Yeah. Because sometimes I, I've like thought it over of the, of the way, especially like as we get further in the game and like McCall becomes a bit more involved uh, with your stuff because like, you're just a freshly like newly minted champion. So he's not going to yep. be too in the weeds with you on everything. No. Um, but as it becomes more, it's, it, there's times when I've been like wondering how am I gonna go about it and have it stay true to what you imagine him as, but also mold him according to like what my story is like, yes, in the Strixhaven stuff, you know, and whether yeah. that will ever like contrast or, you know, should it be a thing where it's like, he's my toy at, in the campaign and I'll mold him yeah. as I see fit and fit him where I need to be. And he exists in your lore separately mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah. Like, is there a way to blend the two? So, cause I do want to keep him still genuine and authentic to what you imagine him as because he is mm -hmm. stemming from your character. Yeah. And I think like if he's in like McCall's interesting because he's a God that we homebrewed mm -hmm. to fit sort of, the lore and the circumstances around my character Anya and to to feed into that well and to really push and challenge her character a lot and to run up against some beliefs that like she has about herself so like for me I think I always was I think I've told you this multiple times when I've been like we just you know we'll sit and like brainstorm about how things might work out or different mm -hmm. scenes or whatever and I think I've told you multiple times where I was like this would be a fun scene to run or, like, it would be funny if this happens, but, like, also if it doesn't, I'll just change characters' names and I'll write it in a novel. And yeah. either will be fine, right? Or, like, I'll maladapt if daydream about it. Like, it's not... I think the beauty of tabletop games is that it is a living, co-created story that is never going to work out exactly how you think it's going exactly. to. So, like, I like to put interesting things on the board and, like, we do a lot of, like, out-of-session RP and it's, like, we flesh things out in there and just kind of in messages between you and I and the Discord about, like, aspects of McCall and aspects of, like, his, uh, his Reapers and, like, where that kind of came from and all that. But as far as in the game goes of, like, I really view that as just, like, interesting things for you to play with. Like, I... And I think it's important to not hold anything so tightly that if it doesn't go the way you imagined it, that you're devastated. Exactly. And if it's, some, if it's something that you are that attached to, that's okay. But you need to write a book about it <laughs> or like exactly. a short story or head over to AO3 or like whatever you need to do. And so I think like that situation in the post where like somebody is connected they're like, hey, I'm 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 writing a book and I'm using kind of this game to flesh out parts of the book that I'm writing. You can do that in abstract, but I wouldn't recommend it as a writer, partly no, just yeah. because I mean, purely from like a credit perspective, right? Of Like everything that happens in the table is not coming from your brain because we're all and multiple people are contributing to it. And so, like, there, there are aspects where, like, the dynamic that we've established between, like, Anya and her ex Narian. I was like, I love the way that um, relationship has played out and been built. And it, it is very yearny and, like, very Colin and Penelope with the pathetic men. Like, it's a good vibe. Um, yeah. And so, like, I will take that as a concept and apply it to the novel I'm writing. Right. Mm -hmm. And, like, I have other scenes that I've kind of come up with in my brain. And things that, like, I just, like, little interesting moments that, like, aren't going to play out in the campaign just because they're not. Like, ev every single moment, you know, that occurs to you at, like, three in the morning is not going to play out at the table. But, like, I can take that and edit it a little bit and put it in a novel or, like, change the perspective or whatever. And, like, I've fully written fan fiction from, like, Narian's point of view. <laughs> <laughs> that like is semi-canon right but like you 
you can't you can't you I think it's important to separate like what you would want to write and what you uh are trying to you can't try to force your D D party in your D D game to like co-create your book with you <laughs> unless that's something you've all agreed to from the jump and that doesn't mm-hmm. seem like what has happened here no and it's also like like we've had a situation in the past where we had somebody that brought in a character like their first real D D character was a character that they've written a lot of like fan fiction around yes. and they've had in their brain since they were like young so there's a very clear idea for them of what this character is what they're capable mm-hmm. of and like you said like the actual game at the table because it's so collaborative it's also very up to chance like whether things succeed or not um it became it became a point of contention whenever their character yep. would fail at things that they perceived them to be yeah. good at um, like your super suave, seductive character is rolling a ton of that one. Anybody for Dick? Yeah, yeah, on seduction, <laughs> and it's like, hey, or even like we've talked about that with like how you thought Narian would be and be kind of very like, and he's turned out boy. entirely different. He's a whole simp, and like both, like you, we both thought of like, oh, this will be a different kind of dynamic, and it's like, oh, we're changed because the dice have their own idea, right? The di- dice are turn are telling their own story, and we got to pivot. And I, yeah. I love it. Same. Um, but it is, it, yeah, it, it, at the table, especially like when you're coming at it from the concept of like being a writer and you have a preconceived notion about certain things, mm-hmm. um, it can become frustrating because, again, in that same vein as like how I believe if you're a DM, the more controlling you are, less fun you're going to have because the more you're going to be like, I had a very specific idea of how this encounter or this interaction was going to go and it went completely different. And you're going to feel, you know, maybe inadequacy uh in your own abilities which is untrue yeah. it's just the nature of the game and uh, or you're gonna be frustrated because you're like i yeah. did all this prep to run this thing that didn't yeah, end up but my like, players went to now. take back two instead yeah which is why i prep nothing so i'm just i'm always <laughs> here we're all we're all in the chaos together um yeah. but like yeah i think in general of like nobody at the any kind of TTRPG table should be trying to control anything else too much. Like Mm -hmm. the DM is directing the direction of the story and is doing more work by product of like they're playing all the NPCs, they're bringing in the outside forces and things that are going to influence the characters or they're taking the pieces of the backstories and like this person on the Reddit said, they're like interweaving them and making it a coherent storyline. But even with that, even with that background work, you're still not controlling what is happening mm-hmm. in real time as the story moves forward. And so if, like for the same reason of like it's very easy to pick on like DMs that are overly controlling, the same thing goes for the players. 100%. As much if not more so of like you can't put that kind of pressure on your DM to be like, "Hey, play out this specific story for me because that's mm-hmm. not what this medium is." And there are other mediums that you can do for that for yourself, but like, it's not what TTRPGs are. Yeah, it's also the the point of like you know, it, and we harp on this all the time. Like the DM is there to ha- the DM and Ch- GM respectively is there to have fun too. Like, oh this, yeah, absolutely, this is their fun. Um, and also like BBGs are something that you put a lot of work into planning mm-hmm. and you know developing and like that last moment that they're gonna have with that character in my opinion should be theirs to have because yeah something that they that that is that is that's their, their they are pc playing. right that that's they've their pc had. that they've mm-hmm. been working so hard in the background to to flesh out and and have it work out in the story that and like this like this person said it already seems like they were very aware that the the dialogue that they were given by this player take away from a satisfying ending probably not just for themselves but for other players um and it's one it's one of those difficult things to do but i think um it warrants again like the open lines of communication Mm -hmm. between game master and player because you know there can be times when you know your player suggests something to you and you have to have like a little sit down where like, hey, bud, mm-hmm. <laughs> let me mm-hmm. let me bring it back down to reality real quick. 
And you don't have to do it in any like, no, we're not going to do this. It's just like, hey, I just want you to like, I get that you're kind of in this like tunnel vision mode of excitement for your character. But I want to like take you out of that for a second and, you know, think about like the overarching story. Think about how it might affect other players um, and how this might come off of. Uh, slightly um and you know because a lot of times i think it's it can also be players not being fully aware that they're doing it in the moment oh yeah well it's like also players like may not players don't have the perspective that Mm. the dm or the gm does it's like like you had a moment in strixhaven when it was like a bex was gonna take her have her character callista publicly announced that she couldn't cast magic and you're like hey this is gonna be a very this is not gonna be strixhaven anymore this is gonna be jailbreak and then we're on the run. Yeah, like, the line, so, the 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 domino effect of that decision is big. Yes, and I'm not saying no, no. but I'm saying I think I you mean, don't understand mm-hmm. the gravity of it, and I want you to understand what the effects might be because I honestly think your character would know that. Yes, this these yes. set of events would then follow, and this is what they are risking. Mm-hmm. And if that is the choice that you genuinely feel is good for you, and you're down for that business. And, and everyone else is, then we can do that it. We can take this buggy on the other road and just <laughs> <laughs> off the road. Just, just we can take her into the bog. Drive. We can go straight in the bog in our Prius Ooh. and hope to God it and works And hope out. she has an aquatic mode. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I've had similar, like smaller moments in VTM with y'all where like I've reminded you that you can lie to people mm-hmm. or like you joked about things and and sometimes I've had an initial reaction of how something would be. And then I've thought about it and I'm like, okay, this would actually be much more serious or it wouldn't be as bad. Or it's like, oh, I figured out a way of, even if you did do this very fucky thing that I could like intervene and have enough. So if you still want to do it, I can maneuver and not have you just be like murked on site. Um, because like we've also had chats with people about VTM specifically where like they had, um, this person I think about had like a had a very specific character that they had lived in their brain for a long time and they've been wanting to play in a campaign like a VTM campaign mm-hmm. but they couldn't find anyone to run the game for them and it's like there are some fundamental incompatibilities with VTM as a system and the way it sets up vampires and how that society works and this character and I'm like hey this would just fundamentally not work so you either need to pick a different system pick a different character or be okay with this character dying in the first or second session. Because, mm-hmm. like, and, like, this is also up to DM discretion as well. Like, I'm a very rule of cool GM, and, like, so are you. But especially in, like, very narrative systems like VTM, there's certain aspects to the lore of the world and, like, the way society works. I'm not going to break for any one character. Because that's where the stakes come from, right? So it's, like... If I let you get away with, like, living with your brother who's still mortal, um, and which is cool and interesting, but, like, it doesn't fit into my world. Because, of, like, mm-hmm. that would get, people would know, would help report it to the prince, and they would have you killed. Like, and, yeah. and your brother. Like, you immediately. To, you have to, you have to have that, that, sh- that sit down chat. It's like, hey, if this is truly in your heart of hearts what you want to play out, cool. But you need to understand what the stakes are. Because yeah. should literally anybody sniff you out, it's going to get real bad real fast. And as long as you're down to play that out and you understand the consequences mm-hmm. of your actions, then yeah. Yeah, well, so like Bex's original character, Cecilia, that she was in the play in Fall of London, uh, which Cecilia is now my toy now because Bex is playing a new character. But uh, Cecilia had a mortal that knew that Cecilia was kindred and that the rest of the mortals were ghouls. And was just like, because most of Cecilia's like ghoul kind of army of employees that she had working Mm -hmm. in her big vineyard complex, like were people that um, she had at one point you like saved or kind of rescued, like offered the option to like help. They were in a bad situation. So she offered to either turn them or turn them into a ghoul and, you know, have them come and work for her. Most of them just agreed to be ghouls and whatever. Um, But there was one mortal woman who did not want to be turned and so i'm like i love that and that's juicy because like she's in a remote like remote vineyard location where like no one else really goes she's kind of there by herself and i was like i need you to know 
that if that comes out, the punishment for it will be final death. Mm -hmm. And like the mortal will be killed immediately on site. Yeah. And like, like the, this, it will not be chill. Like I love having that peace in the game, but like, it's a very big risk. And so that was something that we were going to play around with, uh, with Cecilia mm -hmm. as a character. Um, that that would have been would have been cool and risky to mm -hmm. mess with um as as we went but like bex was like yeah no i'm cool with that that's fine yeah i'm like all right as long as you have those like yeah those open lines of communication it's that so that you are able to sit your your player down and like chat with them about certain things um you know i i have the same moments where like sometimes i have to like I, I have the thing where like, and again, I, this is a bed I made myself. Like y'all are all Nepo babies uh, in yeah. my world and you have so many resources and so yeah. many powerful people at your disposal. We like don't That's track like, money because we're yeah, all we from money. Yeah, we don't track money because you're, you're all from money. We probably have it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, so, somebody has it that will probably Venmo you and it's fine. Um, But yeah, it's it's one of those things that I'm like, okay, I did this to myself. So there are times when I have to like find ways to rein that shit in. Um, yeah. Because, you know, if you'll be like, is this person available to talk? I'm like, that's crazy how they're off on a mission right now. And they're so busy. Yeah, I mean, people are busy. Like, these adults <laughs> so are not busy. just, yeah. They're so busy. Um, <laughs> and like, it's it's a it's a fun element, but it is, uh, or, or sometimes like, uh, uh, I'll hear you all say that you want to do something. And then like, I think it happened early on. And I was like, hey, babes, you are level two. Like, I get that you're powerful little Nepo babies, but the true this isn't going to yeah. fly. <laughs> Sometimes we definitely do babies. get like a little big for our britches where it'll just mm -hmm. like, oh, we could kill this or that person. And it's like, hey, they are like double our, your level, technically. They are. It's they like, are I double your level. Also, you're on campus and like you will yeah. be handcuffed expeditiously um <laughs> so it, it's it's yeah times that you have to you have to have like a a, a come to jesus talk with with your players but that's fine like again you know i don't know that this person doesn't necessarily has any ill intent in in their wishes i don't for think that dialogue so. um yeah it's just I a matter that... of making them understand the perspective of like it is a collaborative game at when you come to the table i get that this is a character you brought in from whatever but when mm -hmm. when you're at my table, that is now my my character. And yeah, I need some to mold it to fit the story that we're playing out collaboratively. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah. Yeah. Like I love we have a lot of especially with like our our bigger characters, like you with Raina and our Oak with with the character Oak and like me with McCall and some of these these bigger characters we have. We do a lot of like alternate universe uh scenarios with them. I think that can be a helpful tool. To be like, okay, you can take the pieces, but it's like these things in this universe are fundamentally different or whatever. Because like, yeah, no, I agree. I think that part person's probably just excited. Mm -hmm. I mean, and like, there are a lot of, there's sometimes a tendency when you're writing to like want to make your, you know, main character this like ultimate victor or whatever, which it's like, those are not the types of stories I lean to. And that's just my preference. Um mm -hmm. But I think it's more interesting if, like, everyone suffers a bit more. But that's just me. Uh, and, like, <laughs> so, like, I get I get wanting to have that, like, big moment. But, like, you can't force that puzzle piece into a situation where you're fundamentally taking something away from the DM and from, like, the rest of the party that's been creating the story together. Just so, like, it doesn't, it can still happen in your book if it doesn't happen at the table. Like, you don't yeah. need, it doesn't have to be the same. In any way, shape, or form. Yeah, absolutely. On to the next one. On to the next. Um, I'll read this one. So uh, the title says, I was lied to as a DM by one of my players. Hey, y'all, I'm experiencing a slight issue as a DM. One of my players asked if they could have a pet as a familiar and assured me that they would just want a pet for RP reasons and just for fun. Which is cool. I can do that. I enabled that to happen and they stumbled upon a scroll to summon a familiar. And with that, they, they still got their pet. Uh, a few sessions pass and now they're actually using the familiar for its utility reasons. I'm not exactly sure what to do. I don't want to just, just take it away because that's rude, but I was lied to, you know. Let me know what y'all think. This one's interesting. I saw this mm -hmm. and I was like, ooh, this is, yeah, this is some like nitty gritty behind the screen stuff that I, I think is fun to talk about. 
ultimately, this goes to go back to like kind of what we were saying previously of like the DM, you are driving the story. So I feel like accountability and honesty with your players is always super important of like sometimes you agree to some shit that you're not entirely sure of the consequences of. And I know like you do that with Strixhaven where you're like, if like I, you kind of reserve rights to renegotiate something if like it's four in the morning when you agree to it. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. And you were, we're all exhausted and half asleep. You're like, Hey, if this is going to be something very different, um, I kind of reserve the right to broken thing that I didn't yeah. realize was going to be as broken as it is. Exactly, because we are not the most like me- we don't run the most mechanic heavy games mm-hmm. uh, to like renegotiate. But I think so. This was interesting to me because like <clears throat> the phrasing of like "oh, I was being lied to" is interesting because it's like mm, were you like the player asked for a pet, and then like there is no stumbled upon in D D of like or in an ATTRPG of like mm-hmm. whatever players stumble upon the dm or gm like set that there right so for sure you gave them you or gave allowed request, them yeah and then they get they, and then they wanted a pet stumbled upon the thing that they wanted right you allowed them to get a find familiar scroll which they were able to cast and so a, f- a familiar is mechanically not the same thing as a pet. As a pet, no. So, like, I don't think it's ill-intended that the player is then, like, using this familiar as a familiar. Now, yeah. like, if... Because, it could like, be a thing technically where... what they have in their inventory was a summon familiar yeah. spell, which comes with a description of what you can and cannot do. Yeah, like, they could have found, like, a mangy little cat in the alley, and that could have been their pet, right? Or, like, a dog or a fucking Komodo dragon or whatever they wanted, right? And it could have been just a normal-ass animal. I think, like, so, like, from the jump, I always think, like, accountability is important there. And, like, I understand feeling frustrated and boxed in and, like, oh, no, I fucked myself a little bit. But I do think it's important to be, like, no, like, they didn't come up with this out of thin air and give it to themselves. Mm-hmm. Like you put a mm-hmm. thing in the world and you made it so they could cast it and they used it to get the thing. Cause they thought that was the fulfillment of their request. Right. So that is important to acknowledge from the jump. Yeah. Now, if like, you want to, there let- is a better way that you could have gone about it. That wouldn't have given them the route to use the mechanic elements of a, of a familiar. Um Yeah. Or they, like you said, they could have just found a little fucking bird. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like if they want a pet, you just give them an animal and just be like, hey, like, you know, very untrained animal that cannot give you advantages because it's probably going to hide if it sees an enemy. Yeah. Like we have that a little kind of similar situation with um, with my character Anya in Strixhaven of like Mm -hmm. her mom had a griffin. And so like she kind of grew up like with her being around griffins and like around her her mom who raised them because her mom was a mounted combatant ranger and my initial idea was like oh after i have chance are not dead like what if zephyrus like briny's griffin like anya just adopted zephyrus and then you were like hey chief you can't have a fully trained like battle griffin that's fucking huge <laughs> at second <laughs> again level. those moments where you gotta you gotta um, rein in your your people <laughs> yeah and I'm like, and I wasn't even thinking it, thinking of it in a way of like, I wasn't thinking I was going to use the Griffin in combat, but I'm like, no, that actually wouldn't make sense. And it would be a much, so like, what we came up with was we found like Embros and Anya went back to their house and like through that there was a very cute kind of sentimental scene where like, um, at her Griffin, she, her baby Griffin, she found Atlas is Zephyrus's son. So now it's like, baby griffin and baby character that are growing together and together. like as yeah as anya's in school like zephyr or atlas is going to go to like griffin kindergarten and then he'll go to like griffin fight club and like learn how to you know yeah and then learn how to and carry for the, stuff for on the his mechanics back. right now he's literally just a pet yeah he's just a big baby he's just, he's just like he's about baby. up to her hip he goes to class with her like a service animal uh, not anymore because we got in a fight in class it was like you're gonna go your ass to griffin kindergarten now 
Um, <laughs> and you can come back when your like beak is fully formed and you can you can fight and snap at things. But like yeah, like I don't use Atlas mechanically, and like I won't um fly on him in battle in any way until like we're level twelve. So until we like graduate, pretty much. And then I've already told you that at level twelve I want to take Mountain Combatant. And then, yeah. like, so what, by the time we're adventuring, now Zephyrus is huge and full, fully yeah, sized. Yeah, and at that point, like, my y'all are level 12, you're big, beefy characters, and, like, yeah. I can justify that you, you can have, have a, war, a war griffin a war if griffin. you want. Yeah. Um, um, but, yeah, that was, that was yeah, definitely a moment for us when I was, like, when we, we were thinking about, like, how you were going to get this griffin. Yeah. It's like, and, oh, there are, like, implications to having yeah. a full-grown griffin. <laughs> Yeah, it's the GM brain because I knew you weren't like trying to fuck me, but I was no, like the yeah. GM brain was like, if I give her a fully mountable war griffin, there's no way, no shape or way that we aren't getting into combat. And at some point you're gonna be like, I'm just going to get on my griffin and fight. Like, yeah, if the option's there, you will take it. And I wouldn't blame yeah. you for it. No, but yeah, I, I was just like, yeah, no, you're not going to have a war griffin at level two. <laughs> like, no, that's not that's not a thing that can happen. No, my guy. Yeah. Um. And I think, like, I don't know, this situation specifically is interesting because, like, I don't, like, having a familiar is not a game-breaking thing. No. It's not necessarily, like, comparing it to, like, the Griffin situation with Anya of, like, having a a flight element to account for in combat is fun That's fundamentally big. changes the game, right? Because, yeah. like, me like being able to go soar up and fucking death drop onto it of like yeah yeah and divine Just smite there and... from the top rope mechanics yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> like like that you fundamentally have to recalibrate how you design combat because you have to account for that like height dimension that you really didn't before mm -hmm. or like if an enemy has that and it's like a flying enemy then that's like a very big weight in their direction that gets negated if we then have a point where like Anya and Jack can go up there and we just like drop kick Jack off and he chops into the net. You know, we can't yeah. It's fundamentally different. But like a familiar, they're nice for like spying or like seeing through their eyes. Um they can give you advantage or like the help. They can action. give you advantage, which like even with like I don't know what the class like most characters class, I assume they're not like a wizard or something that could cast find familiar like mm -hmm. on their own. Um, so it could be a thing where it's like, oh, maybe they can't get, maybe they have like some of the advantages or not others, or even it's like if that like familiars don't have a ton of HP, they're pretty squishy, and so yeah. it's like if that familiar dies, then that familiar is dead, mm -hmm. like a pet, right? So it's like if you try to use the familiar in, like I guess that could Combat be some scenarios. Yeah, or like if you try to use it to spy and it gets caught and someone ganks it, then like you don't have your pet anymore. Yeah, but and I mean in general, like my my philosophy with like the the GM veto rule, um, or like the the right to renegotiate, I guess. Uh, as you called it before is mm -hmm. yeah again like i i agree to basically pardon none i don't deny almost anything um but if yeah if at some point i feel like it might be a little broken or it needs a little readjusting i i don't ever want to take something away but it no. may just be a matter of like let me take a look at the stats of this item and let me see if i can like nerf it a little bit so that it's more appropriate for your level or where we're at um yeah. as characters and, you know, I'm totally down for this item to work at its full capacity later, but like <laughs> maybe not right now. Or maybe this can be something that grows with you, like how we yeah. did with Atlas, where it's like, yeah. I don't want to deny you the ability of having this this little cute baby griffin, but, you know, I'm not going to give you a full grown one, but you can have a baby one and it'll it'll grow and it'll train. Yeah. And then by and, the like, time that you yourself right are now. ready to be out here fighting on a mount. Um, yeah you'll he'll be ready for you kind of thing. yeah because like there'll be a time where it's like he could travel with us or like anya could ride him but she's not gonna fight with him because it is a thing of like how we've worked it out is like we want it to make sense story-wise so it's like he had there's levels you know to be like going from just like mm -hmm. a griffin a normal ass griffin to a griffin that is cool with being 
amount mounted and fighting. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. Like I, I agree of like, I always want to let my players do cool stuff. And mm-hmm. like, I don't, I don't want to discourage that or I don't want to like punish that. And cause like, I've also been like, we've both been in situations where it's like, Oh, we've taken like certain feats or something for a character that then gets like, or we tried to do cool stuff in combat that it just gets completely nerfed by the DM. Mm-hmm. Like the very classic one that we quote all the time is the uh, speak with like speak with undead or speak with dead or yeah, whatever. Speak with, speak with dead. Yeah. Where it's like, no, they have to have a tongue. And it's like, well, that's petulant and stupid of you to say. Yeah. Then right? why the fuck like, do I have the spell? Do I just have to go around and find only freshly dead corpses? Right. It's like, just say you didn't plan well enough with your whole chest and admit that. And like, that's okay. Like sometimes your players are going to throw you stuff that you were not prepared for. And that is as the DM or the GM part of your part of the TTRPG, (laughs) you know, the same way as players, you get stuff thrown at you that you weren't expecting. Like it goes both ways. Yeah. Um, And I think it's like my personal ruling on stuff like that is just like, like if y'all spring shit on me that I was not prepared for, but you were smart enough to think ahead mm -hmm. about something like that and you planned like you chose a very specific spell for that kind of scenario and i just like yep. didn't even remember you forgot that spell of the million spells that exist i'm not yeah. gonna rob you of like the no. reward of that ingenuity no like, that's cool like yeah you got one over on me and now i get to tell you a bunch of lore like oh no yeah poor poor me poor i me. get to actually tell you the shit that i've been I sitting know. on yeah because the opposite is like we're just we're trying we're like please roll high enough please roll a five so i can give please you please look at this painting like, for three seconds longer than necessary <laughs> please like please check for slidey bits and buttons and the weird something old something person. give me like, something yeah like that. that's just my i don't know for this for this like this uh original like poster in in particular um you know I think it warrants a at least at the very minimum a conversation because again I don't know this table I don't know again we're a very specific kind of table yeah. I know of tables that are like they will try to cheese the DM at every and, given juncture yeah and, like it's very like, combative abuse and like use any advantage that they can get yes and I will be fully honest and say like that drives me crazy and I can't mm-hmm. stand it like when me either. <laughs> Like it, I find it obnoxious. I know it's just uh, that is how what some people find fun, and I respect that. But like, it is not what I find fun, and it mm-hmm. just frankly kind of pisses me off because it's like whether I'm playing or whether I'm running the game. Because like, if I'm running the game, I'm not playing against you. I want you to do well, like you said, so I can give you the fun lore and I can reveal more things and I can do more cool stuff. Like, mm-hmm. if you don't succeed on anything, then I'm just sitting on all this fucking lore that I've come up with that I don't get to share. Yeah. Like, I'm not trying to beat, quote unquote, like, beat my players. Mm-hmm. And it's just, yeah, it's also just like a personality thing with me where I'm just like, yeah. can we not? Can we tone it down? Um, But that is what some people find fun. That is sometimes people's only experience, like, with TTRPGs. And so, like, that's the only way that you can play. They've never played in a more, like, collaborative style table. And, like, mm-hmm. that's no fault of their own. It's almost, it is just, like, an adaptive thing. But... Which is yeah, why I like, was like, you know, I can see that if this person is frustrated by by something at, like that you and I don't see as a big deal, like a familiar mechanically it doesn't feel sure. like a big deal to us. It, it may be a big deal at their table because of the fact that like they were yeah. accounting for this person now having advantage on every role. Maybe, yeah. And like other or maybe, things that yeah. might. Maybe it's like an entry campaign where like mm-hmm. having a little spider that can crawl under the door like really has a potential to like fuck your shit up. Yeah. You know, like there, there's a million different scenarios where it's easy to be like, oh, well, that's not that big of a deal. It's like, but it, it could be in a scenario. It could like, be. It depends on we the don't table. Know. Um, so for this person in particular, I would say it's more about like one addressing the the primary fact of like, hey, when we agreed to this, you specifically said it was going to be a pet for a role pet. play purposes. Yes. Now, my bad if I gave you a fine familiar, like a summon familiar scroll, and you took that as like you now mechanically can use a familiar, but like this is what we agreed upon. Maybe I went about it the wrong way, but maybe yeah. you just need to readjust a little bit. And yeah. if a familiar is something you are interested in, I mean, we got to work on how you're going to earn that. Yeah. Yeah. I think like if I was in that situation, it would be a thing of like, Taking accountability for the fact that I did give the fine familiar scroll. And it's like, I can't, 
I can't hate on you using what I gave you um, because that's on me if I'm miscalibrated. And then it's like either, okay, do we want to like have this creature, this familiar turn into just like a full, full normal mortal pet that isn't like a magically summoned animal? Because there's ways to do that. You could go and have, you know, like some kind of like fairy or a hag or something turn your familiar into a real into a real boy like i don't (laughs) i don't know (laughs) it's a fantasy world like there's a million different ways to do Mm -hmm. things or like do you just put limits on it mechanically or do you say like hey if you if you use this familiar as more than just a pet and it dies you don't get it back Mm -hmm. and which like that one's a little more passive aggressive to me yeah um maybe i just also like harm to animals makes me sad so that might also just mm-hmm. be a thing where, like, I never want the pets or the familiars to die. Uh, but it all it all depends on, like, what feels right to that mm-hmm. campaign. Yeah. I think we have time for, like, one more. You want to read Yeah. last one? Okay. So, excuse me being slightly out of breath as I read. I have pots. Um, <laughs> and my, sometimes my lungs don't be lunging correctly. I am a word of like announcement warning before this. I'm going to uh, filter censor some things on this and not like read exactly because there are elements of SA in this. So they're going to be referred to as topically. If that's a thing, that's not good for your brain. Um, we've loved having you. This will be the last one we talk about. So if you need to just call it here, we get it. We love you. Have a have a great day lunch night whatever time it is for you (laughs) um yes but if you want to if you want to stay around this is definitely the most like controversial one Mm -hmm. so just slight trigger warning for that for topical mentions of of essay so this is a title is only girl in the group and the text is my significant other is is an amazing storyteller and dm i absolutely love to wander around his worlds and solve his puzzles i joined his group and after they warmed up a bit They began playing how they, quote unquote, used to, which involves a lot of sexual harassment, uh, enslavement, and essay of NPCs. Uh, Being an essay victim who loved to use D&D as an escape from this kind of shit from the real world, I decided to leave the game and let them have their boys' nights. My significant other is not happy about this, saying they are just joking around and it fits the time period. Now. I'm wondering if this is fairly common or if I should drop this guy totally. I know some games can get it a bit not safe for work, especially when a bard is involved. LOL. That's in parentheses. And that's fine, but it feels more like a regular fantasy as they go into quite a bit of detail. Also, I don't know these other friends very well, and like I said, it took them a little while to reveal their true nature. But I don't think my significant other realizes how sketchy of an environment that is, especially for a survivor. And I feel extremely on edge, to say the least. Do you want to take this first as someone who, like, you know, drop that man and yeah. that table like a sack of fucking potatoes? Honestly, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, oh yeah. no, Th- this one was rough. Not. It got it's one of those like I started reading, and I was like, well, this is bad, and then it got worse as I read it, and I'm like, no. oh, we we found rock bottom, and we kept fucking digging, um, kept fucking digging, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot that here that's yeah. concerning, um. Excuse One, me while I you know, give relationship advice in a D and D podcast for a minute. Right. Go. Do you have? Yeah. Do you have oh something? yeah. It's a. Ooh. Um. One. The. It's it's always a little rough. Uh, being the only woman at an all male table. Um, yeah. Um, and, and there can be some adjustments that happen there. Um. But sure. You know, I played it at uh, some all male tables that were great. It was just like not my favorite style of play yeah uh, when that like the element of like once they got comfortable and they stopped censoring themselves and started exposing a lot of the stuff that they were that they're trying to explore in this specific yeah. fantasy it's like that's who um, they are as people yeah that's who they are as people that is something like within them that they enjoy yeah and that is the hugest of the red flags yep. especially yep in the element of like the like your partner being the person that runs the game, allowing if your partner is comfortable with role playing out scenarios like that with their friends, 
I'm Especially not comfortable with, you present, with that person being in my life. You at should all. not be comfortable with that person at all. No. Um, and you sh- should not be involved with that person, period. Uh, no. Because I don't care if it's a fantasy role playing game that is, in my mind, not acceptable. And two, we've harped on this a million times and over. Like, as a GM, your job is to make sure that every single person at your table is comfortable. Yeah. Moreover, that's your partner. And if they're uncomfortable, you're not putting a stop to any of that behavior. Then you're justifying it as like it's appropriate for the time period. Fuck you. Well, it's also (laughs) that's like saying like, oh, racism happened in the past. So we're going to have really explicit, like. Actual real world racism. And again, it's like, why? Why do you need? Why is that? Why do you need that to have fun? Exactly. Like, why is that fun? Or enjoyable for you why are you not uncomfortable with that and like mm-hmm. that happening at all is a problem for me and i'm done at this point yeah. in my at my current almost you know 28 almost 29 years of life i'm fucking done if i found out that that's happening in the game i'm done with that person i just yeah. can't done i with don't that person like, done with that table done with anybody involved in it yeah like but then it's it's even worse to be like like your partner or your friend or like anyone that cares about you should be an advocate for you and should not do things <clears throat> excuse me that are going to like trigger you or make you feel unsafe or uncomfortable and so mm-hmm. for like her partner to be like well like it's just act like it's not that serious or that's just what like they do or they're just react because that's what happened in the past of like no there's no there's no excuse for that like for no. for me that is a no tolerance thing of like even if i mean the the best reaction you could hope to have with that is like that happens you believe you bring it up to your partner and they say you know what you're right i'm very sorry i did not think that through um i now have a new perspective on this and like I will address it. That is, and that is not good enough for me. Yeah, <laughs> frankly, because where it shouldn't not take for me to stay. Being, no, yeah. not for me to stay in your life. Like that's one of those where it's like, yeah, we're done. That's a burn the bridge, yeah. salt the earth. Like, be done with it. Yeah, um, if they weren't uncomfortable about that stuff even before you got involved, that's not a good person. That n- like, no, no, it's not. That's not a safe not. person to be in your life. No. Um. But yeah, it's it, and it's it also the rough, thing of but... like the quote unquote of like I left and like let them have their boys time or their boys night or whatever. Like I hate the implication that like oh, that's role, okay that that it's okay or that like that boys time is role playing essay because like yeah. that's weird and not fair to men either that don't do that because like no I, the majority of men i'm gonna have enough hope in society to be would be like hey no that's fucked up and like from when i was scrolling of like that was a unilateral reaction um but yeah i was just like no that's not like they're just bad people like it's not gendered it would be bad it would be bad if they were men it would be bad if they were women it would be bad if they were non-binary like it doesn't fuck like matter. any human doing this behavior is yes bad. and like that's not quote unquote boys time that's just toxic piece of shit behavior (laughs) Mm -hmm. absolutely and it's one of those of like when you when you see the red flags you need to like leave and not mistake them for a field of fucking poppies and just keep Mm -hmm. prancing around and again not to people in glass houses like i have stayed in unhealthy <laughs> situations yeah. in emotionally abusive situations with men with friends in D D, like i i am saying this from a place of experience and like not wanting other people to allow themselves to be treated the way i've allowed myself to be treated in the past and the way that i wouldn't anymore but i did at, at point certain points in my life and it's like that's not it's not okay it's it's a very much a when people show you who they are believe them Yes. And like that you have all of the information you need to go into like this veers from like this is almost like not even a D it's the topic is D and D because that's the setting, but like this mm-hmm. is not even like really a D and D issue. This is a just interpersonal like mm-hmm. GTFO issue. 
Um, but yeah, that was like wild and upsetting. And, like I do, I will say like, we were we were talking about this like after we had like filmed that Pantheon stream a couple weeks ago, and we were all chatting after, not about anything in relation to this, uh, but like table makeups came up and like playing it like and like it was uh no we were actually talking about like the amount of like math and combat and like, very like, role play heavy games versus combat heavy games and like how that tends to fall in the spectrum of like uh, men to women or you know men to like, everything in between non-binary folks mm-hmm. like table makeup and like i will say i I have technically, I've never been the only woman. I've played it one, like, male, um, I've played it a couple male-dominated tables. One of those tables was predominantly dominated by gay men, though, so it's like that, again, feels like it's a different flavor <laughs> of, like, no. um, I've never been the only woman at, like, a cis, het, male, otherwise this is a male table. Um... And so, like, I, I was, and I had to drink so many bottles of wine to even enjoy myself playing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like, yeah, I've played at some like technically male-dominated tables, but there's really only been one, and like, I was friends with all the men that were there, and the other table it was like predominantly gay men. Um, but we were talking; it ties into like that uh, combative behavior with the DM that, like, we were mm-hmm. talking about earlier of like that when I hear about that, like when I've heard stories from like you or other friends we have like in the industry, those stories have like typically been at like very kind of cishet male dominated tables. Not Mm -hmm. to say it never happens to anyone else. Like I'm sure it does different strokes for different folks, but like there wasn't like a joke. I think I made after that a story where it's like, I'm so used to playing with women and with queer people. And just like, I, my perspective i think like most of the games i play are with you bex and Alyssa, who are my best friends right Mm -hmm. so i'm very spoiled in the sense of like i get to play the exact type of D &D and ttrpg that i like to play with like my favorite people in the world and so it is sometimes of like i look at other situations and i'm like y'all live like this (laughs) but (laughs) like it is a and like we we've been in that situation in the past where it's been like oh well like is no D D better than bad D&D and it's like well yes obviously but it's mm-hmm. hard like to sometimes it's motivate to yourself to leave when there are, yeah when there's elements of the game that you genuinely enjoy and this is the only way that you get that fixed it can be a difficult place to to be in when you start to justify or try to ignore some of the things, things that like take a bit of the fun away from you um, until it gets bad enough to the point like it sounds like for this person that they were just like I'm just deeply uncomfortable and yeah. don't don't really care to be involved in any kind of like role play that involves that because especially being a survivor you're like i'm being heavily triggered at any point yeah um like that's that's just not fun and i know this person isn't listening um but to anybody that does and relates to that in any way shape or form um if you have any element of yourself that is feeling uncomfortable and it's not something that you feel is going to be remedied by a conversation or the GM does not seem willing to advocate for you or change anything about mm-hmm. the game in order to make sure that you or anybody else at the table is more comfortable, um, then that is not the game for you. And there yeah. are people out there that will play with you and enjoy the kind of games that you want to play. Um, there are different systems that will be better fit for you if yep. that's not the game for you. Uh, like I promise, I promise. There's you. and it is the thing of like you are better to not have that and have your mental and emotional peace than you are to try to force yourself into a situation that you fundamentally don't feel safe in. And like my flag for this has always been of like when I find myself starting to dread the process of like going to game and like that can happen for a lot of reasons. It's not always something this severe or like in our past experiences, mm-hmm. like. That is when I'm like, when I'm just kind of like, ugh, or like when we don't play and I'm relieved, then I'm like, okay, it's, it's That's time for me to leave or to rethink this or to like rethink how I'm, how I'm spending my time because like time is very limited for, for everybody. And yeah, it's, it's hard sometimes to feel like you're going to be the only dissenting voice. Um, and I think there, but it's still important to advocate for yourself. And like most 
I think this is an extreme, extreme example, right? Most conflicts at the, the table, most table disputes to use Red Attack, you know, can be solved with a conversation. I think like there are some things like this where it's like, I don't necessarily think that that warrants a conversation. No. And like they fully like, do not pass go, do not collect $100. Yes. And like are people I'm I'm sure there are people that disagree with me on that. I'm sure there are people like, no, you should talk about it. And like, listen, if you want to have a conversation about her, you feel like that would help you, you feel like that would give you closure, fine. But like you do not fundamentally owe anyone that makes you uncomfortable like a conversation as to why, like role playing, especially something like role playing essay is like not appropriate. Like you you are not required to educate. <laughs> you know, people in your life on like why what they're doing is fundamentally is bad. Right. Yeah. And like you, a, cu- you a can... couple of mantras. Yeah. That I live by is the same thing. Like you do not owe anyone anything ever. And you have mm-hmm. every right to leave a situation. You don't owe them a conversation. You don't owe an explanation. Fully no. leave, block that person and move on with your life. And that can feel real hard for some people. But trust me, it's with Gold. repetition because plenty of people like... plenty of people with repetition it becomes easier plenty yeah. of people have done that to you you can protect your own mental well-being and just sure out of a situation yeah and additionally to that um just yeah no like that's that's just a shit situation and if you're uncomfortable in any way shape or form absolutely not like yeah no those are not those are not your people no and it very much is of like you have not met all the people in your life that will love you and that will like be your friend or be your be your found family or whatever and so i think like it's easy to feel isolated or especially like you know in the post-covid times of it all or mm-hmm. like we all sort of it's getting better but we all kind of forgot how to be a person a little bit during during mm-hmm. quarantine but, like it's, it's very easy to feel alone and feel isolated but it's like no there are people out there for you and you just Like, you're not helping yourself by staying in a situation where you're going to be hurt and, like, more traumatized. Because that's just going to make it harder to, like, show up and trust and enjoy being around other people that are the right people for you. Mm -hmm. 100%. With that, I think we're coming up on time. This has been great. I can't wait for us to do it again. This was fun. I like Uh, this. This was good. This is fun. Um, but thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you had a good laugh. I hope you connected with something that we talked about. And, uh, hopefully if you're having a bad experience at a table, you've got gotten the courage to leave that situation. Yes. If anything else from this, that will, that will be my, my reward. Yep. Pack up your and little traveling stick, like a Tamagotchi animal and get the fuck out of there <laughs> and just leave. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for listening and joining us for another episode and we will see y'all next time. Bye. Bye. Table Talk is a podcast brought to you by Mythos Media Productions, bringing you a new episode every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Table Talk RPG, or check us out at our website, mythosmediaproductions.godaddysites.com. All business inquiries can reach out to us via email at info at mythosmediaproductions.com.